and welcome to the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. My name is Jesse, and I'll be your host. Before we get started, please make sure you subscribe to the show on your podcatcher of choice, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to give the show five stars and a one to two sentence review, and tell me what you think. If you'd like to follow the show on social media, you can do so on Instagram at Cult Cinema Circle or on Twitter at Cult Cinema Circle, or you can send me an email at Cult Cinema Circle at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Letterboxd at Jesse Kremp. J-E-S-S-E-K-R-E-M-P, all one word, and all social media links will be put in the show notes. Now on with the show. And welcome back, y'all. So today we're going to be going over what I watched in the month of September. So we'll start with some TV shows and then also just move into the movies that I've watched. So in terms of TV shows, I did end up finishing and watching the whole series of Arcane, which is a League of Legends show. So I would recommend that one. It's on Netflix if you're in the US. And the second season is actually come out I think in November sometime but you don't need to know anything about League of Legends because I'm not that gamer type of person so like uh, my boss has told me to watch Arcane a bunch um, because he is a, a gamer person and anyway but it's a really good show. It's about these two sisters and, um, you know, I don't want to go into it. Just go watch it for yourself. Okay. If you're, if you're interested, please do. Uh, the other thing I was watching was I was also watching a little bit of one division as well. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't end up finishing that. So maybe I'll come back to it, but I did start on that. Cause I do kind of want to watch Agatha all along because my boy from Heartstopper is on there. So, uh, and then of course I will be watching Heartstopper in October. October. You already know I will uh, when that shit drops. So, yeah. And then I haven't really been watching a whole lot of Sabrina. My other podcast, Other Rumor Bus, has come out. So go listen to that and everything. But if Sabrina the Teenage Witch is your bag, I guess. But uh, I haven't really been watching the episodes really like that. I already have some content uh, banked a little bit, but I will get back to watching Sabrina at some point for the other pod. But with all that being said, let's move into our movies that we watched this month. So the beginning of the month, I ended up watching a movie from 1986. It was Manhunter. So this is, of course, part of the Hannibal Lecter series. I think it was the first film adaptation of this kind of series, which then, of course, like you'd have of uh, The Silence of the Lambs, obviously, uh, Hannibal Rising, uh, Red Dragon, all that stuff after this, and then, of course, the Hannibal television series. Um, But yeah, this is kind of the first film adaptation. Um, So the plot of this is like there's a killer on the loose. They're called the Tooth Fairy, and it's up to a criminal profiler played by William Peterson, also known as Grissom from CSI, um, with a colorful and traumatic past to try and capture him once and for all. Um... Yeah, I generally found this movie pretty entertaining. I gave it a three and a half and a little heart. I'm not usually one for like crime procedural type of movies. I can get into some of them, but like not all of them. Um, But I think this one was done pretty well. It also gives us another universe, uh, Hannibal Lecter, which is played by Brian Cox, um, who is in like Trick or Treat in the end, um, little segment, and then also in The Autopsy of Jane Doe, as well as Emile Hirsch's dad. Uh, So yeah, fun times. It was was a good time. I think a big theme of this movie is definitely dealing with like past trauma and trying to move past it as you can. Um, so Will Graham, who is, uh, you know, uh, William is Grissom. Um, <laughs> he's trying to live a more normal life. Um, and he's trying to just have this, but he's pulled into this like tooth fairy case and it's just dredging up some bad memories for him. And I think all the actors do a really good job in this, uh, in my opinion. Um, so William Peterson, of course, is our lead. Tom Noonan, for those who may know, he was in The House of the Devil from Ty West, um, but he plays the Tooth Fairy. Uh, Brian Cox, like I said, plays, you know, Hannibal Lecter. And also Joan Allen. I really like Joan Allen. She plays a blind blind woman in this movie um, who is kind of with Tom Noonan and gets romantically involved with him a little bit. Um, And of course, I love Joan Allen from like uh, uh, Pleasantville specifically, but like uh, I thought she was really good in this. It was cool to see her like in a younger role, which is nice. Um, the dialogue of this was fine. Um, it's a crime procedural type gig, so I'm not really expecting any like moving pros or anything like that. Um, but it was fine, and I thought the cinematography and lighting of this movie was really top notch, in my opinion. I thought it was very well done. And they could have shaved some time off of this. It wasn't the u- worst um, use of like two hours, but I mean, they could maybe this movie was like an hour 45 or something like that. I don't know. Um, 
But I will say uh, the soundtrack of this movie, it's a little bit of a weird soundtrack for like a crime procedural movie like this because I don't really know how the soundtracks of those are. Um, but I vibed with this one, though. I kind of liked it. And I think Michael Mann um, did a pretty good job at directing this. And I would maybe check out another one of his films. I don't really know his filmography like that. So I would check it out. Um, and I think this sets itself apart from being like the... F- it sets itself apart as a part of being like the first film adaptation within the Hannibal Lecter timeline um so if you're at all interested in like looking into that I would check this out um I haven't seen the Hannibal movies from the 2000s of course I I have seen and I own the Silence of the Lambs so uh this one's a good one to start out with though so yeah the second movie I watched was actually a Stephen King adaptation it is The Dead Zone from 1983 Uh, so if you've never seen The Dead Zone before I gave this a three star Um, this is pretty much about a school teacher played by Christopher Walken he has a near death experience and he is put into a coma for five years and during the course of this he somehow has attained the ability to see the future and then drama ensues after that pretty much Um, so this is a Stephen King adaptation so it has like the normal atmosphere of just like dread that comes along with any sort of Stephen King work. Um, this is also directed by David Cronenberg, so any fans of him might want to check this out in particular. Um, because yeah, it's a definitely different. This is not really a body horror type thing or anything like that, but yeah, I thought it was a good time. And uh, yeah, the biggest theme I think I got from this was like, if you could prevent a tragedy, would you do it? Kind of a thing. Um, and I also see how the theme of like acclimation and isolation are explored in here as well um, because really uh, the uh, Christopher Walken's character is really trying to acclimate from you know being in a coma for five years um, but he's also feeling very isolated and it's just really interesting to look into that and see it I think Christopher Walken does a really good job in this performance personally and also I think Martin Short uh, does a great villain in this as well um, which I thought was really cool with with his character I thought the dialogue was pretty good. I mean, it gives me Stephen King type prose, of course, because this is an adaptation. So, you know, I I liked my time with that. And I really like the setting of this. This is set in, I think, like the north. I don't remember exactly where. I probably Maine, obviously. Um, But it was uh, it's set in the winter months. I think this is a good winter watch, especially since we're getting into that season a little bit. Um, But I like the shots throughout this film as well. Um, I thought the pace of this was pretty decent and I don't really think it overstayed its welcome or anything in terms of runtime. I thought the sound design was pretty good. Um, I thought the soundtrack had the right amount of attention to it. This didn't have like needle drops or anything like that, but I did think that the score was perfectly fine. Um, and out of the other films from Cronenberg that I've seen, which I don't remember them off the top of my head right now, but I think this is a little bit lower down for me. Um, I think another director could have probably taken this material and uh, found something better to do with it. Um, but it's not bad i mean you know but it it didn't blow me away or anything it was cool though to see this kind of male psychic story because you don't always see that all the time um which i don't really know if it was a thing at the time of the release um i thought this was a perfectly fine movie i probably wouldn't really watch it like just readily but i did generally like it um and i thought it was interesting because i talked about stir of echoes what last month or the month before or whatever the hell and there was definitely a direct reference from dead zone in that movie and there is so i was like oh okay that's the stir of echoes part or whatever so yeah but uh yeah that's what i ended up watching for that then the next thing i watched is actually what i'll be watching Uh, well, it's actually coming out next week from when you're hearing this. Um, I watched Psycho 2 from 1983. Um, I gave this a four star and a little heart. I really like this movie. Um, I actually, funny enough, I had watched it on September 5th of this year. And the previous year, I also watched it on September 5th. So I don't know how that happened, but I just thought that was funny. Um, if you don't already know what Psycho 2 is about, uh, it's 22 years after a series of murders. Uh, Norman Bates, played by Anthony Perkins, is released back into the world after after being institutionalized. And when he's trying to live his new normal life, um, he's hearing and seeing visions of his mother, and everything is not as what it seems. 
And I think this was like a huge risk to take on such a classic story that did very well. And this film, personally, for me, is endlessly entertaining. Um, I think it's definitely a must-watch for any Psycho fans out there who might be curious about the sequels. I've only seen this sequel personally, but I love this fucking sequel. I think it's great. You'll hear all about my thoughts on it uh, when the episode comes out. But yeah, um, I think a huge theme of this movie is definitely of redemption and how things can change. Um, and I think also so there's a case to be made about commenting on the cyclical kind of nature of violence and abuse that happens um, as well. I think you can definitely kind of see that, which I thought was cool. Um, and yeah, there's something a little different here, um, especially since it's now the 80s. Uh, Anthony Perkins, I think, did fantastic in this role. Of course, he made that iconic character in the 60s and for him to come back in the 80s and do it I thought he did very very well and shout out to Vera Miles for coming back as well and also Meg Tilly in one of her early roles they were really fantastic through this movie um, and even though it was hard for Meg Tilly and Anthony Perkins to work together um, I thought they did a really good job I think Tom Holland did a really good job with the script. I think most of this is presented pretty easily and digestibly. You know, it's it's a pretty, uh, you know, if you've seen Psycho, you could watch this and know what the hell's going on, which is good. Um, this is a really good, f uh, fantastic cinematography from Dean Cundey, and I think the settings of these films are just top-notch in general. Um, the pacing of this was good. Uh, the runtime could have maybe been trimmed down just a little bit, but I think overall it does work out, and and I also think Jerry Goldsmith is obviously a very well-known composer. Um, he does his best with the score. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hold a candle to really Bernard Herrmann's score, but I will say it's not bad. Um, it's actually very, very good. But yeah, it's not the same, obviously. Uh, but it wants to. It needs to set itself apart because it is a sequel. So there's that. I thought the direction of this was pretty good. Um, the this balances horror and mystery really well together. Um, Apparently, Richard Franklin was also kind of tough to work with as well, um, from what Meg Tilly has said, but what director kind of isn't sometimes, um, because it depends on the kind of director you get when you are on a project like this. Um, but I think this movie does exactly what a uh, sequel needs to do. It really carves out a space for its own self within the franchise that it's a part of, and I think this movie does that in spades, and I just really like it. I don't own it or anything. I don't own Psycho either, but like... Maybe I need to pull up and get that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The next thing I watched actually was a movie uh, from 2017, and this was Satan's Slaves, actually. This is, I think it is from Indonesia. Let me look. Yeah, Indonesia and South Korea. It's like kind of a, um, a co-production, if you will. Uh, if you don't know what this is, so after dying from a strange illness that she has suffered for three years, a mother returns home to pick up her children. And that's all I'll say. It's actually a little remake of... Of also an Indonesian like horror film from the 80s or late 70s um, but I, I pulled up on this I think Girl That's Scary had done an episode on it and I wanted to kind of listen to it they did this in the sequel um, which is part of this but yeah I uh, I, I liked it I, I didn't really I didn't make a big rundown about it or anything like that but it is pretty cool and I think if you are at all interested in getting into Asian horror of any sort um, which also, if you have Criterion Channel, you can watch J horror stuff on there, and I would I'm gonna pull up on that probably this month sometime. But yeah, uh, Satan Slaves is on Shutter right now. I would definitely go and check it out. Um, the next thing I watched is actually coming out tomorrow. From when you're, uh, I think it's coming out the same day. I might be putting this up. I uh, did not get this up right uh, at the beginning of October, so I, I had other things to do, but. I, uh, you're going to be hearing my episode on Mean Girls, and I was watching that uh, in this month, in the last month. Um, I mean, do I have to go over what the hell Mean Girls is about? I mean, it's about Katie Heron, played by Lindsay Lohan. She enters North Shore High School um, after making some quirky new friends. Um, this is like of an uh, artsy weirdo and a 2004 gay teen. She then is ingratiated into the popular clique, The Plastics. Um, this movie, of course, is I gave this a four and a half and a little heart. I really like this movie. It's highly rewatchable, and it's been quoted to death by everybody who's a millennial. Um, I think the energy entertainment value in this one is just high for those who are interested um and i think obviously the biggest theme of this would be fitting in while you're in high school and like losing yourself when you get a lot of power at that time and there's plenty to be said about the friendships between like females at that age um the toxic nature can take on and all of that so definitely it's there 
I really love uh, some of the actors in this. So Lindsay Lohan, Rachel McAdams, and Lacey Chabert specifically, I think, are doing some really good work in this. And even, like, uh, shout out to Amanda Seyfried. I mean, she's a fantastic actress. Um, her character is really one note in this, but that's fine because she does a really good job at doing that. But it's not like there's a whole lot of layers going on with Karen, I don't think. But I really do like that. Uh, she just doesn't get to shine as maybe much, but she plays Flighty very well, and I did like the kind of core four here. Tina Fey does a pretty decent job at like making a tight, you know, uh, quippy script um, and the made up kind of teen speak um, mixed with the actual slang in this is like, you know, appreciated, of course, um, because teen movies are this kind of time capsule and it's nice to kind of set that self apart. Um, I think the shots of this movie and the cinematography are did, done really well. They do a really good job at making uh, Canada look like the Midwest a little bit, uh, which is cool. And I also appreciate the outfits in this as well. They feel correct, and they I feel like real people would actually wear them. Uh, the editing on this is pretty well. It literally gets in and out in 90 minutes. It packs a punch, and I like that. Or at least, you know. It gets in, gets out, and I think it does deliver its message, which is nice. Um, the soundtrack of this is awesome. It feels very contemporary for the time being um, in the film of 2004, so I liked that. And I thought Mark Waters did a really good job at directing this film. He really understood how to make this like school environment feel very authentic, um, which he had done in Freaky Friday. He was able to really bring that environment to life, um, which I thought was really cool. And I mean, Mean Girls isn't exactly the most like original story in regards to being a teen girl movie or anything, but I do think it's carved out a place in popular culture. It continues to this day. So I think it has done its job in some way. Um, and yeah, it's definitely done that. And you'll hear all about that on my Mean Girls episode. Uh, the next thing I watched was actually, uh, it's going back a while from to 1969, and it is a Midnight Cowboy. Um, so if you don't know what <coughs> Midnight Cowboy is about... <coughs> Sorry. Um, Minute Cowboy is about this guy, Joe Buck, who's played by a young John Voight. Um, he decides to move from Texas to New York, um, and he becomes pretty much a male sex worker. And in New York, he meets this guy named Ratso, played by Dustin Hoffman, a year after he'd been in the graduate. And uh, you just follow their like butt budding friendship as they're just trying to survive in the late 60s New York City, pretty much. Um, I gave this a four star and a little heart. I actually really liked this movie. The premise of this movie was really controversial at the time. Um, and this has the distinction of being the first um, and probably only X-rated movie to ever win Best Picture because it was technically rated X. Uh, regarding entertainment value, I can't say that this is like that rewatchable, but it's a movie that I think is exploring some taboos at the time, and I really do respect, respect that for it. Um, I think this movie really hits like the loneliness that one can feel when you move to a place where you don't know anybody. And I think this film also is an interesting exploration in like male friendships and just how deep that can go. Um, this movie has the distinction of why it was kind of like rated X is because um, it did kind of connote like homosexuality and stuff. And it that was definitely kind of a, an underlying theme here a little bit. Um, so, you know, oh no, gays, we got to turn it X rated apparently. Um, but you know, I just think they have a really good, uh, friendship really. And they, they really do love each other. These two guys, um, not in a romantic way, but yeah, there's that, uh, the two leads of this film are doing a really good job. Um, and it makes me really believe that they are each other's best friends, which makes the conclusion of this movie hit ever more. Um, even though John Boy is like a weird conservative Republican, um, currently now, but I thought he did really good in this and it makes me want to check out some more Dawson Hoffman stuff. Um, I didn't really, uh, I didn't enjoy him in The Graduate as Benjamin personally a whole lot, but I liked him in this, um, and I would be I would be interested in looking at other things he's done to kind of see some of his other characters. Um, I thought the scriptedness was pretty good. It was it gets right to the point, which is nice. Um, and I thought the cinematography was really fantastic for what it was doing. All of these locations are really shot very beautifully. I appreciate a lot of the world that is built in this film, which is really cool. Um, and I thought the editing was really good too. It's very wild in some places, like very psychedelic in some ways, because we're still at the late sixties. But I find it really unique, and I think it adds to the mind of Joe Buck. Um, and plus he has his like flashbacks and stuff like that too, which is really interesting, but he's just trying to kind of deal with his own like past trauma he's experienced, whether that be like maybe being kind of sexually assaulted by his like 
grandmother growing up or maybe also dealing with the fact that he saw his like girlfriend be assaulted um in front of him like all this kind of stuff so i mean uh, there's a lot to be said with this um i enjoy the soundtrack uh the opening title sequence is probably the most well-known thing in this movie one of the most well-known things um that and i'm walking here you know that kind of a thing but uh the opening title is actually really good too and you also see like literally i don't know if you see his penis but like you literally see john voight pretty much naked which is really interesting i was like oh okay um (laughs) and the music throughout of this just helps upset the world which is really cool I think John Schlesinger, who I think might have been gay, like, I don't actually remember, but, like, somebody was gay involved in this, because this is also based off a book, if I'm not mistaken, Um, but he does a really good job of directing this film. I think his vision is very clear throughout the whole film. I think he nailed the execution of this, and there's a reason why it won a Best Picture. I think this is movie is a very one of a kind type of movie in my opinion. I think it was seen as a classic for New Hollywood for a reason. Um, this movie also wasn't afraid to like tackle these like kind of gay undertones or these themes. Um, I commend it for that because you know it's just part of what you have, especially when you move to a place like New York. Even back then, you definitely it's different than Texas, um, at least at that time, especially. So yeah, it was really interesting to kind of see all that. So yeah, but Midnight Cowboy, I finally watched that shit, and there you go. <laughs> the next thing I watched was actually um, it's been on my list for a minute, um, but it was called uh, it's called The Legend of Billy Jean. If you don't know what this is, uh, so this is about. Um, uh, this is about a girl named Billie Jean, played by Helen Slater, Supergirl. And, uh, well, she is a Texas teenager. I guess they're in Texas. I thought they were in Florida, to be honest. Uh, but Billie Jean Davey, uh, she is caught up in, like, an odd fight for justice. She is usually followed and harassed by local boys because she's very pretty. But... Uh, these boys decide to trash her brother's scooter for fun. Um, her brother is played by a young, if his, I think it was in his first role, Christian Slater, by the way. Um, the boy's father, uh, who's a creep, refuses to pay them uh, the price of the scooter. And the fight for fair is fair takes the teens around the state and produces an unlikely hero. So, I mean, with all that being said, I mean, like, The Legend of Billie Jean was pretty awesome. Like, honestly, uh, I gave this a four and a little heart. Um, I think this movie is just so cool. Uh, this fails to mention that the father of the guy who, like, uh, fucked this bike up or whatever, the the scooter, um, he also kind of assaults Billie Jean a little bit, doesn't actually, like, literally physically sexually assault her but like literally like comes close to it um and she like uh well somebody gets shot pretty much i mean and then they're on the lamb they're on the run kind of a thing it's a whole thing i mean like i thought this movie kind of rocked personally um it also has some random people in it. So like uh, Yardley Smith is in here, the voice of Lisa Simpson back when she was an actress, like not Lisa Simpson, which I thought was interesting. Peter Coyote, who's in Wild Walk to Remember, and he's been in stuff as well. Keith Gordon shows up here as well um, as like the kind of a uh, love interest uh, to Billie Jean, which is interesting. And also even like Caroline Williams from tcm2 uh she plays like a little small part in here which is just really interesting but i really liked the legend of billy jean i think you should check it out it was on youtube for free um and yeah if you want like kind of a kick-ass 1980s like teen girl movie but like it also is about just like justice in general and i don't know it's a it's an awesome movie dude like i i liked it so um yeah check out the legend of billy jean i don't think you'll be at all um i don't think you'll be at all uh disappointed in my opinion but uh yes uh in in uh in celebration of spooky season, I decided to, uh, because, uh, I've been watching the Goosebumps crew podcast. There's a whole podcast uh, about Goosebumps. There's a couple of them, but like this one is a little bit newer. They've been getting some good guests on. They've been bringing some of these Canadians back and talking to them about being on the TV show, which is cool. Um, but yeah, shout out to the, the Goosebumps crew. But um, they got me kind of wondering, because I, of course, love The Haunted Mask, as you may know, listener. And I love The Haunted Mask, too, as well. Um, but I've been wanting to maybe check out, and I finally did, The Werewolf of Fever Swamp. So this is how... Uh, 
Uh, this is the take on a werewolf story, pretty much, uh, for Goosebumps. This is one of the two-parters that they did back in the day. Uh, this movie is, it's, it is a movie. It literally is a, an hour long, pretty much. Um, this is about Grady Tucker, who is played by a young um, Brandon Fletcher, I believe, um, who's that kid Mark from Freddy vs. Jason. Um, he plays this kid. He moves into a new house with his family next to a swamp. And uh, a swamp deer is killed because um, his family, his dad and mom are like, I don't know, biologists or something, the animal people. Anyway, um, his father believes that Grady's dog, who he just got, um, a vandal, I think it was, or something like that. Um, uh, they think they're responsible for it, but Grady is convinced that a werewolf is actually the culprit. This is a really interesting little story. So you have, like I said, young Brandon Fletcher. Um, for anybody who may not know, um, the guy in this uh, who is kind of the like swamp hermit, if you will, I guess, um, who people think is like the werewolf when he actually isn't. Spoiler alert. Um, but uh, that guy is actually the dad of uh, voice actress Cree Summer, which is fun. I thought that was really interesting. I found that out after my my fact. And uh, I kind of liked this. Like, I didn't watch this when I was a kid or anything. And so, of course, I'll always go back and fucking watch like Goosebumps. But I thought this was really good. It. this is um i think seen as sort of like the one of the scarier episodes because it does feel like a little horror movie like honestly i know a lot of those things are going to feel like horror movies because it's goosebumps but like you know some of them are a little more sillier than others but like it's this one and like also i mean i love the haunted mask don't get me wrong but it also has a little bit of a different thing but like stay out of the basement also has a little bit of that too so yeah, I love Stay Out of the Basement, too. Um, but yeah, uh, enough about Goosebumps, I guess. But uh, yeah, the next thing I watched after this was actually uh, my cousin Vinny from 1992, because it was part of Courtroom Dramas on Criterion Channel. Uh, so this is a Jonathan Lynn movie. He is also the same guy who did uh, the movie Clue back in the 80s as well. And he also did um, like the whole nine yards and stuff. But uh, yeah, if you don't know what this is about, this is about two um, pals who are driving along and they pretty much get mistakenly uh, arrested and charged for a murder that happens in Alabama. One of their cousins, though, is a lawyer, Vincent Gambini, who's played by Joe Pesci uh, after his Home Alone success and good, uh, was it Goodfellas, I think, or whatever he was in. And um, yeah, yeah, so him and his girlfriend, uh, played by, uh, uh, it was Mona Lisa Vito, but played by Marissa Tomei in an Oscar-winning performance. Um, yeah, they come to this Alabama town and, um, well, uh, it's like <laughs> uh, Joe Pesci's character. He's trying to like um, defend his his uh, cousin and his friend, um, being a first time lawyer. And you know what's interesting about this movie is that it's um, kind of like an interesting like. I don't know, like, you know how Legally Blonde's kind of like that, too? Like, this is literally, like, Legally Blonde. It's very funny, because, like, this guy, Vinny, is so, like, you know, he's so fucking, like, New York, New Jersey, you know what I mean? And, like, Marissa Tomei also kind of is, too, which is great. But I think it's so funny is that, like, yeah, it's just, like, that kind of a thing. And I just, I like, I enjoyed this quite a bit, in my opinion. Also, fun little thing is that this movie is very, uh, actually pretty decently accurate when it comes to, like, actual trial proceedings, which is really interesting. And I was watching videos about that on the internet um, and seeing that, you know, especially lawyers are like, no, that actually is pretty pretty accurate uh which is so cool to see and i just think this is like a, such a good little movie i gave it a four and a little heart um yeah it was it was a good time uh you know and marissa Tame was fucking awesome in this movie so yeah there was that the next thing i watched was actually on um i think it was friday the 13th if i'm not mistaken um because <laughs> i was you know uh feeling myself on that day uh so i watched cherry falls from 2000 which i'm covering this month um if you don't know what cherry falls is it's about these uh 
kids in Cherry Falls, uh, Virginia, I think. And uh, there is a serial killer who is killing virgins. And the kids decide they are going to uh, make a party for Pop Your Cherry uh, and not be virgins anymore, pretty much. And it's Brittany Murphy uh, starring. And uh, there's also Jay Moore and uh, oh, is it um, Michael Bean, I believe. Uh, yeah, this was uh, a fun little time. I did a whole episode on this uh, with the boys from Video dropbox so you'll check that out in this month uh i gave it a three and a half a little heart um I, I liked this movie enough i didn't really write a ton of things about it to be honest uh but i did generally like this movie and um i actually own it so i'm happy that i own it this is also has the distinction for being one of if not the most expensive tv movie ever made because this movie was supposed to be released in theaters um but it got pulled from that and it instead premiered on usa the channel in the u.s so yeah uh, that's how it made its debut and uh, it kind of got sidelined a little bit so but yeah go listen to that episode about that when it comes out uh but yeah you'll hear more about that uh, when i get to that um, and then uh, finally, because he told me to watch it and it finally is streaming on Shudder, is I watched In a Violent Nature from 2024. If you listen to the Friday the 13th episode I did with Pickens, he told me I should go watch this movie. I told him that somebody from a Friday the 13th movie was in this movie uh, and he blew, it blew his mind. So that was fun. Uh, but if you don't know what In a Violent Nature is about, it's pretty much about this uh, undead killer named Johnny and uh, you're following him through his journey of uh, getting back a lot from you know his mom uh from these teenagers who have decided to i guess be at a cabin and you know live their young lives <laughs> um and he's got to kill all of them and beat all their asses pretty much which is great um yeah i liked this movie i gave it a three and a half and a little heart um, this is not going to be for everybody. Honestly, I get it. However, this was right up my alley in a way. I kind of liked the ambient, like kind of horror, if you will. Like I haven't watched like skin and rank, for example. So I, I probably will not honestly, but like this was not at all like some people were like oh my god it's like fucking skin and or whatever or it's like you know you're just following this guy you know uh, around you're following this killer or whatever and i was like i mean it's not exactly like that dude like what are you talking about um i, I don't know like i'd have to watch skin and i guess but like i'm just saying like it feels different to me in my opinion uh but i don't know whatever i haven't watched that so i don't know but I'm just kind of like, really, bro? Like, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> um, the next thing I watched after that was actually a little film from 97, and it's called Wishmaster. This is actually a Robert Kurtzman film, which he is a very well-known uh, effects makeup dude. Um, and this is Wes Craven presents uh, Wishmaster. If you don't know what this is about, this is about a thing called the Jinn. Um, he has been released from his ancient prison, and he is trying to capture the soul of the woman who had discovered him, uh, thereby opening a portal and freeing his fellow, uh, you know, uh, Jin to take over the world or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, this is a fucking wild ride. It's uh, very over the top and campy, but I generally enjoyed myself with Wishmaster. I kind of liked it. Um, it has really cool special effects. Obviously, the director is a special effects makeup dude, so that makes sense. There. Would have that. Um, they definitely got the K and B guys because he is one of the K and B guys, but they were able to really, you know, they really hit it out of the park with this one. So I, I like Wishmaster. I never really watched it before, and it's been on my list to kind of watch. So I, I generally enjoyed myself with it. So yeah, definitely that. And it, you know, I don't know if the sequels are all that good, but goddamn, like, why not? I also watched this with the um, Horror Queers commentary. They did a uh, commentary on this a few months ago and I was watching it with that which was kind of fun the next thing I watched was actually um, a documentary on HBO. It was called Rock Hudson, All That Heaven Allowed. Um, this is pretty much talking about Rock Hudson, um, who is a actor from back in the day. He did a lot of these um, kind of romantic lead type characters, melodramas, things like that. And um, yeah, well, he was also one of the first people, one of the first big prominent celebrities who was who had died of AIDS back in the 80s. And, you know, it just it kind of chronicles all these things um it talks about just like 
you know, this public ladies man that he was put as, but also his private life as like a gay man. And he was trying to kind of figure that out. Um, it talks to, it talks to people from his life and kind of really makes it very interesting. And, and I, I liked it. I didn't rate it or anything because it's hard for me to rate some of these documentaries, to be honest, but I, I generally liked this. So if you're at all interested in Rock Hudson or old Hollywood a little bit or any of that kind of stuff where you want to learn about what it was fucking like in 1980, it's like USA being gay. Um, check this out. You might learn something. You might get some background. Um, it was really cool. I, I, I enjoyed watching it. It wasn't too bad. Uh, uh, the next thing I watched after this was actually Paranormal Activity, uh, 2007. Uh, this is about a uh, this is about a mid middle class couple who moves into a new house or who moved into a house, and uh, they're experiencing some paranormal activity. And uh, well, the boyfriend <laughs> decides he wants to film it, um, and uh, hijinks ensue from there. I did an episode on this. That's what I watched it for. But um, yeah, I gave this a three. Uh, these are not exactly my favorite movies necessarily. However, I mean, I see why they are important, I guess. So that's all fine and well. But again, I'm not exactly the uh, biggest fan of these. Um, but I can't say that they're like horrid or anything. But I didn't really love the first Paranormal Activity. Um, but I did end up watching it like two times because I had to uh, for podcast purposes. And then... Um, Similarly, I watched Paranormal Activity 2, the next one, um, actually on my sister's birthday, funny enough. Um, and I think I liked this a little bit more than I did. I think this was like my favorite out of the three that I watched because um, I did watch Paranormal Activity 3 the next few days. Um, yeah, that was another one where I think it goes maybe Paranormal Activity uh, 2 as the top for me. I then liked Paranormal Activity 1, and then I don't think I liked 3 as much, although they're a perfectly fine trilogy to be honest with you so that's just what i think but yeah i mean that's just kind of what i i kind of gathered from that but i did want to watch that for episode purposes just because i wanted to have that background but i haven't watched the one with like Catherine newton yet i haven't watched the marked ones or um like next of kin or any of that stuff so um maybe i'll get around to it but i'm not pressed to do that <laughs> uh but after that i actually watched um because I'm covering it next month. I actually just did the episode not too long ago, but it'll be edited when you hear it. I did Steel Magnolias. So I watched Steel Magnolias from 1989. Um, in my opinion, I really like this movie personally. I think I gave it a four and a half at one point. I think I maybe bumped it down to a four. I don't remember. I guess I did. Um, this oscillates between a four to four and a half for me. Um, if you don't know what Steel Magnolias is about, it's about these women, um, kind of group of friends uh, in a small Louisiana town and um it's just about life it's about just like you know births deaths all the things man and it's really awesome it has a all-star cast of like Julia Roberts Sally Field Daryl Hannah Dolly Parton uh, Olympia Dukakis Shirley MacLaine uh Dylan McDermott's there. If I can, all these people are in it. So you'll hear all about my episode that I, I do it with. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a good little time, and I generally enjoyed myself when I watched Doing Magnolias again. Uh, and it also looks really pretty. Like I like it. Um, I think it is perfect when it comes to like balancing comedy and also drama, which is really good. Um, so I thought that was kind of a, a good deal. And because I wanted to be f somewhat fair, um, I did end up watching the remake from actually 2012. Um, there was actually a Lifetime movie. Um, this is pretty much just a shot by shot like remake of the original film. It's almost like a line by line type of thing, too. Um, so this has uh, it's a uh, black woman version of this uh, original film. So like Queen Latifah is Sally Field's character. Uh, Alfre Woodard plays Weezer, who is Sean McLean's character. Felicia Rashad is Clary, who is Olympia Dukakis. Uh, Truvy is Jill Scott. That's Dolly Parton's. And then Shelby um, is played by Felicia Rashad's daughter, Dola. Um, Rashad, uh, and then which is apropos because her, uh, you know, yeah, her mom's there, so it makes sense. Um, and then, uh, Adepero Odoi, uh, I believe, uh, is plays a nail in this, so yeah, it was a good little time. Um, you know, I didn't think it was like super terrible, but it's definitely not something where you know, like, it's literally just a shot for shot 
remake it just is different because it's black women instead of white women which is fine um and so culturally it makes a little bit of sense like for example like uh you know in the church scene they have different types of music you know um because you know going to a black church is a little different than going to a white church you know so that makes enough sense. Um, they do the wobble song at the, uh, the reception, the wedding reception. That was kind of fun. I was like, oh, this is shot 20. Okay. Yeah. 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 This makes sense. Uh, but yeah, no, it was a good time. And then obviously like the beauty song's a little different because this is like a modern day in 2012, but also going to a, uh, black hair salon is a little bit different than going to a white one. You know what I mean? That predominantly has white clients. So I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't bad. I just didn't, you know, it was, it was fine. Like, you know, if you want to watch it, it was on YouTube. Um, I would try to try to find it for free if you, if you can personally, but you know, I'm not gonna tell you to rent us, but you know, that's just me personally. But yeah. Uh, so the next thing I watched after that was actually, uh, I'm going real back into my, uh, I'm going real back. Uh, it is uh, Leave Her to Heaven from 1945. This is like the one of the oldest movies I've watched. Um, good old Leave Her to Heaven. I watched this because it was on Criterion Channel. I had actually tried to watch this before when it was on Plex or something like that. And I didn't end up doing that. But uh, this movie is fucking rad. Uh, it's... Uh, a socialite who's played by Gene Tierney uh, marries a prominent uh, novelist played by Cornell Wilde. And uh, this spurs a violent, obsessive and dangerous jealousy within her. Um, Gene Tierney is so beautiful in this movie. Um, she's actually kind of an inspiration for the character of Courtney Shane a little bit uh, for Jawbreaker, which was really interesting. Um, Rose McGowan had seen this movie or watched this movie and kind of based her character off of this a little bit, which was cool. Um, this is also a early Rand Vincent Price role as well. It was one of his earlier things he had done. Um, but yeah, I would check this out. Uh, this is obviously an older movie, um, but it is so fucking cool. Um, I really liked it personally. So, so yeah, I would check it out. Fucking uh, Jean Tierney is wild. And what's her name? What's her name again? Like, what is her name? Her name is uh, Ellen. Girl, Ellen's wild, and I'm telling you something. But like, uh, she was kind of fabulous though. But I will say, it's fucking crazy. <laughs> Uh, then the next thing I watched was, uh, actually from 2002. Um, I decided because I think the movies that made us gay, I did an episode on this a couple of years ago and I wanted to be in on the, you know, I wanted to be in on the ground floor. Um, and I decided to watch cause it was on hoopla, I think, and it was going away. I watched the hours from 2002. Um, if you don't know what the hours is, I pretty much just said, let's get sad and gay, baby. Um, this is based off of a book and this is about three different women who are throughout time and they're searching for more potent, meaningful lives. So this follows, um, Virginia Woolf, um, played by Nicole Kidman in an Academy Award winning performance where she had a prosthetic nose uh you then have julianne moore who plays a 1950s housewife in los angeles and then you have meryl streep who's playing a lesbian who is uh, in a relationship with isles and janney um in like the modern 2002 new york city um yeah their stories intertwine with each other it comes to like a uh kind of surprising transcendent end if you will um yeah there's a lot going on there's some gay stuff in here obviously like Meryl Streep's a lesbian in this movie with um, Alice and Janney she has a gay friend um who is like dying of AIDS what you know that whole thing fucking happens uh yeah this movie was was good um i ended up giving it a three because I, I don't think i i didn't hate it or anything but i was like i don't know it didn't exactly affect me the most i guess but i i would definitely recommend it um because there's also some really fabulous like supporting actors in this like uh fucking tony collette's amazing in this movie also margot martindale's there that's always kind of fun um you know it was a good time like i don't know like it, it was cool to watch and i could appreciate it but i don't know if i'll be watching it again anytime soon but you know yeah like i would, I would go check it out if you want to like go ahead do it <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> the next thing I watched was actually because I got my uh, Teen Apocalypse Trilogy Blu-ray in the mail from Criterion Collection. So I now own the Teenage Apocalypse Trilogy from Greg Araki. So I own Totally Fucked Up, uh, the Doom Generation, and Nowhere, which is what I watched when I got that. I actually watched it with the cast and director commentary. So they had uh, a couple different people, Nathan Bexton, James Duvall, uh, Jordan Ladd. Um, um, the girl who plays Egg, I don't remember her name right now. She's French. A um, couple different people. And they had Greg Rocky, of course. Um, it was a good time, you know. Um, if you don't know what Nowhere is about, this is about uh, these people in Los Angeles. Um, uh, so it's like this friend group who is just like, you know, trying to make sense of their lives. You have Dark Smith, who is played by James Duvall, um, his bisexual girlfriend, um, Mel, who's played by Rachel True, her lesbian lover, uh, Lucifer, played by Kathleen Robinson, um, and then their gay, uh, shy gay friend, played by Nathan Bexit Montgomery. Um, they are going to Juju Fruits party, um, and they're only going to be able to make it if they can survive the drug trips, the suicides, the trysts, the mutilation, and the alien abductions that occur as one surreal day unfolds. Uh, yeah, I fucking love Nowhere personally. Personally, there might be some folks who hate it. And to that, I say, uh, mind your business. Like, I like it. Um, yeah, this really is like a, and it literally says it, it's a tagline. This is literally an episode of 902 and O on acid. Like, it really is. So, if that's up your alley, please go watch Nowhere. You can find it on YouTube. Um, but you can also, you know, Maybe get this little Teen Apocalypse trilogy if you want to you know, spend the money on it. Uh, or if you have the money, you know, whatever. But I generally really like this movie. It's uh, Mysterious Skin is still my favorite Greg Rocky movie. But this one is also, it's just so fucking chaotic and weird. Um, and it's right at my fucking alley, dude. Um, but yeah. <laughs> And the next thing I watched, because I watched it twice, because I'm crazy, um, but I am also covering it at the end of this month, is I watched Nay the Demons from 1988. Uh, I watched this with the director, cast, and special effects commentary, and then I also watched it with the producer's commentary as well. Um, and then I also watched like the little featurette, it's called You're Invited, where they talk about like you know the production of the movie and all that shit. Um, if you don't know what Night of the Demons is, it's about these uh, partygoers who go to a deserted funeral home called Hull House, and they decide to have a little seance, um, and then, well, they awaken something evil with a thirst for blood, um, and uh, they have to survive the night, which most of them don't, but some of them do. This is such a cool, cool little movie. I love this little movie. I gave it a four and a little heart. Again, I'm covering it at the end of this month, so that'll be really fun. But, like, yeah, it's a good time. And, uh, you know, killer bad bitches, you know? Like, you got Angela being fucking Angela. I love that. And um, special effects look really good. Like, I am a fan of Night of the Demons, so that's why I am covering it on the show. But also, like, you know, I just felt like watching it again, especially since it's October. October, I thought it would be kind of fun to to pull up on that. And then the next thing I watched um, was I actually uh, tracked it out to the theater to go see because I couldn't not see this. Um, I decided to watch uh, The Substance from 2024. Um, this has kind of been in the, you know, the zeitgeist a little bit or people have been, you know, the, the horror fans have been kind of, uh, you know, they've been all sorts of up about this movie really this is the second feature from Coralie Farge um, who's the director of Revenge I loved Revenge and this is about a fading celebrity played by Demi Moore Elizabeth Sparkles she decides to use a black market drug a cell replicating substance uh, that uh, temporarily creates a younger better version of yourself um, and yeah and again, it's got the girls heated. Uh, but I will say that, like, I... So here's the thing. So, like, when I watched the movie and I sat there for all two hours and 20 minutes, and I was like... I, when, I got out of, when I got out of the theater, I walked to my car, and I was like, 
did I like that movie? Like, did I even like that? And I will say that I gave it a four at first and I was like, okay. Then I had to think about recency bias a little bit. And then I was like, all right, you know what? I think that in this situation, I, um, would give this a three and a half. Um, that's not because I hated this or anything. I did enjoy it overall. I think Margaret Qualley does a really good job in this. I think Demi Moore does a pretty decent job, especially since she's making herself look super ugly in this, of course, because um, that's kind of the point. Uh, but it looks, you know, nice and sleek. Um, I mean, if you're a fan of body horror, I would check this one out. Um, and again, it gets the girls heated. It gets the girls wondering and thinking. Um because I've seen people criticize this movie, but I've also seen people love this movie a lot. I'm just happy that there's like weird shit out there, if anything. So I'm kind of like, you know, hey, let's do the fucking thing. You know what I mean? Um, I haven't seen Strange Darling or anything yet, but I also was kind of like, yeah, bro, let's let's get these uh, <laughs> let's get this weird shit out there, man, uh, out in the theaters because you know. Um, that's what I want to see, and that's what I want to maybe throw my money towards. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah. And then the final movie I watched this month was actually for an upcoming episode um, that I will be doing next month in November. Um, but I watched Faster Pussycat Kill Kill from 1965. Um, yes, I'll be doing that the next month, actually. So if you listen this far, you get to know about that. Uh, but this is a Russ Meyer movie, of course. This is about three strippers, three go-go dancers. Um, they are seeking thrills. Um, and, uh, well, they encounter a young couple couple and after killing the boyfriend um they take the girl hostage and they begin scheming on a uh you know a handicapped old man who is living with his two sons in the desert and well uh craziness ensues from there this is a movie uh has Teresa Tana in it Lori Williams Haji uh Susan Bernard um all sorts of fucking things. It's a Russ Meyer movie, so listen, there is a lot of belts, there's a lot of boobs, okay? Uh, but you don't ever see the actual boobs, but like, you know, they, they pushed up to high heaven, you know, and I appreciate that. Um, this movie fucking rocked. Uh, it, I gave it a four out of five, personally. I didn't give it a little heart. I don't know why I didn't do that, but I probably will, you know, whatever. And uh, it was it was a good little time. Um, you'll find out more um, when I actually record my episode. I'm recording it this weekend, actually. Um, but I, uh, I'm i going to get a nice little history lesson about Russ Meyer, I'm sure. Um, but of course, he's the same guy who did like this movie and Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and definitely exploitation movie a guy loves him some big boobs um you know so and he's all about uh but that's the cool thing about him because like he yes he i think he loved women a lot i don't think he was ever really trying to exploit women or anything like that i think he really yeah well we'll get into that but it even something like this like it's such a fucking awesome movie and we'll talk more about it on my episode but like i really think this movie it just has such a legacy to it because so many movies after it of any kind of like bad female or, you know, any kind of like any kind of thing where like, uh, kind of this in your face femininity hard edge whatever you want to call it um i think it's really interesting and and yeah i i liked my my uh i liked my my episode on that i i liked my uh my watch of this personally um and hopefully my episode will be really really good and i think it will be but yeah and that's how I watched uh, all this stuff in the month of September. Um, for the month of October, fun little thing, I'm trying to participate in uh, two watch list challenges, uh, one for horror queers um, and then one for haunted hippie, uh, like I kind of did last year. So be on the lookout for that. I'm going to have like 60 something movies probably that I'll have watched because I'm crazy. But yeah, you know, the Halloween season is upon us. It's time to get all creepy uh, out here and uh, watch all the weird horror movies. Uh, we then have some other releases coming up. We have like Terrifier 3 coming up. 
up. I don't know if I'm going to see that yet. We'll see. Um, you know, we, we've got some shit going on, you know, and, and so it'll be fun. And then you, again, you have all these episodes to, to, you know, kind of listen to. I'll also have, you know, Sabrina stuff happening as well, you know, with the, the Sabrina, the Teenage Witch podcast that I'm doing. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, but yeah, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to listen, um, to my, what I watched episode and I will see you all in the next one. Uh, take care everyone. Bye. Bye.